how does she know that there's a point of view right there? Because there's no wire intercept. So wire intercept is always zero. Good. So uh, we can view these direct variation equations since they always look like this. Y equals A times X, a number times X. Well, we could look at that as Y equals MX plus a B that's always zero. Right? All these direct variation equations, they always look like this, which means they always don't have uh, a number over here, a plus or a minus or anything over here. So uh, we talked about it last time. It's, it's not that there's no y-intercept. There is a y. It does intersect, uh, or intersect the y-axis, uh, but always at zero. It's just not there. Okay? There's a zero there, so the y-intercept is always zero. So uh, let's see, because direct variation equations always y-intercept of zero, always. <coughs> I want to be technical here. It's, it's the way that I am. I'm going to say graphs of, graphs of, of uh, direct variation equations always have a y-intercept of zero. Um, so that was correct, but y is Mira's second point incorrect. John? <coughs> because it says one burn, not uh -huh. three. Not three. So the, the, the slope that she used is not the slope she was supposed to use. So what what is the slope of her line? It's <coughs> the slope is one burn. This slope is, oh, why is it oh, the one that she drew. Oh, the one that she drew is, is <coughs> the slope of what? Sorry. <coughs> is um, negative 3 D1. Negative 3 over 1, right? The slope here is negative 3 over 1. She's, she flipped it over. Right? She, should, she went down 3 and over 1. She should have gone down 1 and to the right 3. So that would have been correct. This line, no good. This point's good, this point's good. Draw that. And just keep that going. <coughs> All right, Carlton here has correctly identified this data as represented direct variation. So he says, yes, there's direct variation. And here's his work. Um, if you take a second and look at what he's done here, you can see he's done 5 divided by 1, 10 divided by 2, 15 divided by 3, 20 divided by 4. So I mean, he did that. I, I, I don't know why. You know, why is that correct? Why does that, what does that prove? When you just say y divided by x, why does that prove uh, that the data represents direct variation? So again, take a pen or a pencil and write that down. Write down your response to that. explanation might take uh, two, maybe three sentences or commas to put it all together. But I kind of have a string of, of logic that tells us why this would prove that this is direct variation. You might want to chip away at it or just tell us completely. Okay, so good. Um, so you said that because y equals 5x, it's drift variation. 
Um, because we're able to write it that way, uh, we're able to always take x and multiply it by 5 to get y. That's the, the very definition of direct variation. Um, that that kind of sums it all up. So let's maybe pull it apart and unpack it. And so a direct variation equation always looks like this. Always looks like this. So if you can figure out a number that goes there and that it works, then yeah, it is direct variation. Right? Um, and if it's, if it's going to work, it's got to work for every example, right? It can't just be for the first one or two. It's got to be for all of them. If this last one was 635, then it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be working for the last uh, data point, and so it wouldn't be direct variation. <clears throat> but y equals 5 times x doesn't work for every one of these uh, order pairs. Okay. Um, so if this is direct variation, this equation needs to exist. Right? There needs to be some value of a uh, that we can plug into this equation. So why has Carlton decided to divide y by x? What has he found right here? What does 5 have to do with what we're talking about over here? Substitutes for A. Okay? And so it's not it's not too difficult of a question. I, I, I may be too simple of a question. It sounds harder than it actually is. Why is he dividing Y by X? Why does that find him A? Does he just decide out of the blue to take y divided by x, and that just must prove that it's direct variation? What, what kind of logic, what step did you take from here to there, to taking y and dividing by x and saying, well, that'll give me a? You can take a look at this equation. Could you, did you find a in this equation? Could you solve for a? How do you solve for a? Get a by itself. Divide by a on both sides. Divide by a? Yeah. So I'm going to get a on both sides. Then I'll get x equals y over a. So almost. We, we, solve, we wind up solving for x. Let's solve for a, right? Divide by x, we can see if we divide by a, it cancels the a. So if we divide by x, it should do the same thing, only it cancels the x. If I multiply a times x and get y, then I should be able to take y divided by x and get a. Right? 3 times 5 is 15. Then 15 divided by 3 should give me 5, or 15 divided by 5 should give me 3. So we divide both sides by x, we get that a is equal to y over x. So that's what he's doing over here. Taking y and he's dividing by x, if it is direct variation, then he should get the same number every time. Right? He should get the same number every time. So y divided by x is 5, y divided by x is 5, y divided by x is 5. It must be that <coughs> this number times 5 gives you this number. This number times 5 gives you times 5. x times 5 gives you 20. x times 5 gives you 30. Uh, so it does work. And that's Carlton did. Or if you were to just say hey, y equals 5x, that, that works. You just kind of take a guess at what you think the equation is. Um, Bridger, how did you decide that y equals 5x works? Did you go to kind of guess and check? Or kind of guess? So you looked at x and you said, oh, I, I know that if it's direct variation, i got to multiply this by something to get that thing. So Maybe it was more like, hey, look, I, I just multiply that by 5. Does that work again? Yeah, multiply by 5. Yeah, multiply by 5. I multiply this by 5. Multiply this by 5. Works every time. Direct variation. And that's the same thing that Carlton did. 
Lydia has found the direct radiation equation correctly. Here is her work. So why do you think Lydia's first step is to write y equals a times x? Why is that? Why does why is, why is the first thing that she writes down y equals a times x? So she can set it up correctly. Set up her next step correctly. Yeah, her the next. Um, that's good. Yeah, so maybe uh, it helps her visualize it. Helps her to see the kind of equation that direct variation needs to have. If I say that y and x vary directly, or uh, y varies directly with x, or uh, this data is an example of direct variation. If those words direct and variation come up together in the same uh, sentence, then the meaning of that, the meaning is that y is equal to a constant times x. That is, if you looked it up in the dictionary, direct variation, it would say the meaning is y is equal to a constant times x. And so she's just reminding herself of that. That's, the, that's how y and x have to fit into this equation. Right? And to write this equation, she just needs to know what A is. What is A? Kind of like this previous one. If he has this very direct variation, we've got to be able to write it as y equals A times x. Uh, Bridger said, hey, 5 seems to work. 5 did work. It worked for every x. Turn every x into y. Uh, so it was direct variation. So if it's direct variation, y is equal to A times x. You need to know what A is. Okay. So what does Lydia do next? How does she figure out what A is? What she says here is, I know, since it's direct variation, that I need to be able to take x times a number and get y. x times a number and get y. Okay, so John? See, you replace <coughs> mvx with a given sense and y with 15. If this is direct variation, I should be able to take x, multiply it by something, which I don't know what that is yet, and when I multiply it by that something, I should get 15. I need to get 15. So I just need to figure out what that number is. What do I multiply negative 6 by to get 15? Right. If you go all the way back to third or fourth grade, I don't know, when, when you learn division, or probably second, third grade, I don't know. It was a long time ago for me. Um, but that's how we used to ask the division question, right? What do I multiply 6 by to get 15? That's the division question. Right? So we divide both sides by negative 6, divide 15 by negative 6, we're saying, what do I multiply negative 6 by to get 15? Okay. And then we just simplify that, that uh, fraction, negative 5 over 2. So A must be negative 5 over 2. Right? So we put that right there. <coughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, I just want to remind you that, because this is the kind of question Sometimes it'll be on a standardized test. Uh, you get this wording a lot on like the AP calculus test and things like that, where it says something varies directly with something else. Okay, so if y varies directly with x, that's not true. Okay. What does that mean? Y varies directly with X. I'm trying to get you to say it, because 
I've already said it several times this morning. What does it mean that binary is right for the X? As I said earlier, if you looked it up in the dictionary, here's what it would say. Exactly what it means, the definition of varying directly. Y is equal to a constant times x. Okay. There's other types of variation. You can say it varies inversely, it varies uh, to inversely to the square, or varies right, whatever. Here is one of our first examples of that specific vocabulary. That y varies directly with x just means to get y, you'll take x and multiply it by a constant. That's one thing. That's the definition of varying directly. What about uh, graph of direct variation? There's at least two things I want to just pull out of this and remind us. What's something about all graphs of all direct variation that's consistent throughout? Go through the origin. Go. Same thing. And one other thing that I won't make you sit there and wonder what, what am I asking? A, right, that A right there. What's the relationship with A to the line when you graph the line? If you were to graph, for example, y equals 5 halves x, well, you know it's a y intercept of 0, and 5 halves would tell you what? The slope. A is the slope of the line. So A is the slope of the line. A is M. And y equals M. Y equals MX plus B. Okay. Um, any other questions from the other part of the homework? Bridget? Y varies directly with X, does X vary directly with Y? Okay? We just talked about this in the, in, the, in the last page we just were looking at. What does it mean to say that Y varies directly with X? Yeah? Y equals A times X. And so to get Y, we should be able to take X and multiply it by A. Now A is just some number, right? A number, a constant number. This number could be 5, it could be negative 4 thirds, it could be any number at all. Okay. So what would it mean for x to vary directly with y? y varies directly with x. What about if x varies directly with y? What would that mean? Yeah? <coughs> um, x equals a times a y? Yes. x equals a y, right? They just reverse the rules of x and y. If x varies directly with y, then x is equal to some constant times y. Okay. So the question is, maybe let's use something other than a, just so we don't get confused here. It doesn't have to be the letter a. Let's say b. Right? Some, it's just some number times y. So if y varies directly with x, if, if x times a gives you y, then can we mess around with this and get it to look like this? x is equal to something times y. Well, one simple way to put it is, let's get x by itself and see if it looks like this. Okay, can we get x by itself? How so? How do we get x by itself here? Yep. Divide by a. Divide by a, very good. Divide by a, cancels it 
So does this look like that? Uh, quite. Could it? Could we get it to look like a number times y? This to look like a number times a number times y. What number would that be? How, how could we write this as something times y? What would that be? So that it's the same as this. Multiply, if we're going to divide by a, what would we have to multiply by? Multiply by a? All we need is, is something to be here. Some number to be there. Some number times y. And that number can be a number. It can be a fraction. It can be a decimal. It can be a digit. It can be one. Just the number one? Is one times y the same as y divided by a? We need this to be the same as that, to be an equivalent. Just a, okay, so maybe it's just a. Is a times y the same as y divided by a? No. no. Maybe we, if we did uh, you know, 3 divided by 5, it wouldn't be the same as 5 times 3, right? Getting there, though. What, what can I multiply y by? But if, when I multiply them together, what I get is y divided by a. Let's try it this way. Let's try like some specific numbers. What if I took y divided by 2? Could I rewrite this a little bit so that it looks like something multiplied by y? But it comes out to be y divided by 2? Multiply straight across, we get, what do we get in the numerator? One times y, y. Two times one, two. Right? If you take uh, six divided by two, that's the same as six times one half. Right? Fifteen divided by three, same as fifteen times one third. Right? Remember that? Hope so. If you divide by a number that's the same as multiplying by one over that number. by a. What could we multiply by that would be the same as y divided by a? Yeah. Well, a is not 2, it's just a. 1 over a. Yeah, 1 over a. If we multiply these together, y over 1 times 1 over a, multiply straight across, get y over a. Let's get rid of that over 1. Okay, so let's look over here. If x varies directly with y, that means that x is equal to b times y. What, what is b? What does b represent? Okay. Yeah, it represents a, what does, what kind of thing is a or b? A constant, right? A constant is a, it's a number, right? It's just a number. So b just needs to be some number. Is 1 over a some number? A was 5, would 1 over 5 be some number? If A was 15, would 1 over 15? What if A was 5 thirds, would 1 over 5 thirds be some number? That's just some constant number. So if Y equals A over X, then we can write X as 1 over A times Y. Right? We could just let 1 over A be this number that you multiply by Y. You get X. So does X vary directly with Y? What, is that, what needs to be true for x to vary directly with y? x just needs to be equal to some constant times y. If 
y equals a times x. We can divide both sides by a, get, a, get x by itself, and write this as 1 over a times y. Okay. x equals 1 over a times y, if you want to write it from left to right like that. For, y, for x to vary directly with y, we just need to be able to put some constant in there. Is 1 over a a constant? Yeah, let's, let's look at an example. y equals 3x. There's a direct, uh, a bear, uh, an example of direct variation. Right? Does x vary directly with y? Can we write x is equal to some constant times y? Well, let's see. Divide by 3. Divide by 3. And that's just equal to 1 third times y equals x. x equals some constant times y. That's the definition of direct variation. That's, yeah, that's direct variation. Even if we did y equals 3 halves times x. Let's see, can we get x by itself? How do we get x by itself? James? Divide by 3 halves, very good. That'll cancel out the 3 halves there. Uh, dividing by 3 halves, we don't like to not divide by fractions, right? So instead of having to divide by a fraction, how do we rewrite it? Instead of dividing by the fraction, we can do what? Right? Multiply by the reciprocal. Multiply by the reciprocal. Not three halves. Reciprocal of three halves is two thirds. We started out with y equals three halves x. That was direct variation. It's a constant times x equals y. And we were able to rewrite it so that x equals a constant times y. That's direct variation. So if y varies directly with x, does x vary directly with y? Yeah, it does. Because we can say if y equals a times x, then x equals 1 over a times y. And you can see how we got there by just getting x by itself, by both sides by a, writing it as 1 over a times y. So, yeah, these are both examples of direct variation because we have a constant times x gives you y, a constant times y gives you x. And the answer would be, yeah, it does. From the 38, x does vary directly with y if y varies directly with x. Any other questions? Twenty-nine is uh, it's identical to thirty-six except for the numbers are different. Okay, so if x and y vary directly, if y varies directly with x, then y and x must fit into an equation like that. Y equals a constant times x. <coughs> no, that because in the instructions it says y varies directly with x, that they have to fit into this equation. And they're asking us to write that equation. What, what part of this equation are we missing? What part do we need to be able to plug in? A. We need to know what A is. They don't tell us what A is. They do tell us that Y varies directly with X, and what else do they tell us? They tell us this. That when X is 3, Y is 9. And they tell us that y varies directly with x, they're saying that you should be able to take 3 and multiply it by something to get 9. All right. That's what you know when it says y varies directly with x. Well, if that's true, we can just kind of figure that one out, right? I know it has to multiply 3 by to get 9. Or we can put 9 in there, put 3 right there. I know I should be able to take 3, multiply it by a, and get 9. 
divide both sides by 3, and 3a, just plug that back in, and y equals 3 times x. That's the normal work, please. Start 4.7 by uh, first talking about what a function is. What's a function? How do we define a function? I made you look it up before. It has inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs. Big important deal there. Inputs. Go to outputs. Might have a function usually almost 100% of the time in a math class. We're talking about functions that do this with numbers. Right. So I input a number, maybe three, and I get out a number, the output might be 15. In a number of five, I might get out an output of 17. Okay? That doesn't even need to be a specific rule. Usually there is. 100% of the time there is a specific rule. Um, but it just takes an input, it turns it into an output. And there's one other thing, it's really important. To be able to be called a function, you have to meet this second condition. Do we remember what that second condition is? One side has to equal the other side? That would be to be an equation, right? To use that equal sign, both sides have to be equal. Not sure offhand? Just go ahead and just look it up in the glossary. I know it's back there. Or the index will tell you where it is in the book that you can look it up. Glossary and index, two good useful tools. This part, prepare inputs with outputs, put in a 3, get out of 5, put in a 7, get out of a negative 12, so maybe that's the pairing part. Mm -hmm. So all of the inputs, so one input might be a 3 or a 5 or a 7. All of the inputs together, put together in a big set, big group, is called the domain. The domain is a set of all of the inputs, all the things you put into a function. And likewise, all the outputs, and okay, there could be a single output, an example would be 12 or 5 or 16 or whatever. All of them together is called the range. Okay, that's that part. There's still this other. That's a lot of vocab there. It's not actually a, diff a separate part of the, the definition. There is one one extra part to the definition that we have to meet to be a function. Yeah. Each input stands on the one. Yes. Each each input. Like if an input would be a three or a seven or whatever, uh, has only, only, or you could say exactly one output. So if I put in five into this function, I need to only get out one thing. I can't put in five and get out seven or twelve. That's not a function. Okay. Some times that happens, we'll have something that works that way. It puts out two things, it just wouldn't be a function. Okay? So a function, this is like a really important part. I couldn't say that it's more important than this. Okay? But this part's just kind of assumed. Okay? The, the things that we work with will only put out one output for every input. Okay? I mean, Here's an example of a, well, can somebody give me an example of a function? It doesn't have to be amazing or awe-inspiring, but something that you put things in, and then when you put things in, you do some calculation and something comes out. It's an example of a function. Yeah. 
I use them all the time. It's in last section, section before that, section before that, section before that. For weeks and weeks and weeks we've been using functions. Why are those five x plus four? Exactly right. And y equals five x plus four. There's a function. Okay. You now that somebody's taken the first step and said, here is what I'm thinking is a function. I'm sure everybody can give an example of another function. Put a number, another number in front of x and minus some number. Or we could even do y equals crazy stuff like 3x squared minus 2x plus 7. Like That's a function. We can put stuff in for x and get stuff out for y. Okay? Those are functions. In this one, if you put in, uh, say, a zero, because it's going to be easy, zero squared times three is zero, minus zero plus seven. So you put in zero, what are you going to get out of this function when you put in zero? Seven. Right? These two go away, they become zeros, you add seven, you get seven. And zero times seven. Can you think of something like this? It would not be a function that, that you put something in and you get two things out? Basically, what I'm saying here is would violate this rule right here. It, each input has to have one output. How could you have, a, have something that has two outputs? How about this one? Technically speaking, this one would have two outputs. Let's take, take an example. What does it mean, the square root of 9? How do you know you found the square root of 9? Yeah? Exactly. That's what the square root of a number is. What number times itself gives you 9? What is that? What is the number that multiplies by itself to give you 9? 3. Is there any other number that you can multiply by itself to get 9? Positive 9. Multiply negative 3 by another negative 3, you get a positive number, a positive 9. Okay? So I put 9 into this function, it gives me out, well, I can put in 9 and get out 3, but I can also put in 9 and get out negative 3. Well, that's not a function. Okay? So, not a function. Okay? But most of the time, we work with things that are functions. Work with functions all of the time, and all of our functions look like this. Y equals something with X in it, and you know, and whatever. We do whatever we do with it. So the important thing about a function that we need to be able to think of is that when you put in something, it gives you out something. If you can boil it down, I've said this before, if you can boil down a function to that basic relationship, and you understand that when I put something in, happens to it and another thing comes out and these are our ordered pairs like graphs make sense uh, equations make sense like all this stuff starts to make more sense if you can boil it down to input and output something goes in and something comes out okay um, so now we're let's say we're talking about a bunch of different functions mix them up here you give me an example of a function John, can you give me an example of a function? <coughs> y equals x plus 9. There we go. There's a function. Can we get another function? Bryce? Um, y equals x uh, times 5. Okay, so 5x. Okay, y equals x times 5. Yeah, Jada? 5 equals x minus 3. Minus 3. There's another one. Okay. Uh, anybody feel really inspired to just give me one because I just got a doozy? John. Y equals x divided by 4. Well, I like that. X divided by 4. It's different. Okay, so we've got four different functions. We're going to talk about something you can see over there in our, in our what we learned today list. Function notation. What is that? And I'm going to give you an example of why we use function notation. Why, why are we going to do this new thing that uh, is inherently confusing? Um, 
and it's there's a bit of a learning curve when it comes to function notation, but we'll make it as as uh, simple and as, as smooth a process as possible. Okay, so we we have these four functions up there, and I want to talk about one of those functions. How do I distinguish one function from another if I were to just point at it and talk about it? Four people in this row. Or really, I would call it a column. So these four people, right? Right here. Okay. If I want to talk about one of them, how do I identify them? Usually. The way they look. Maybe the way they look? <laughs> Their name. Right? I would say that would be the, the, the first thing you say to somebody. If you're talking about one of these four people, you're you're saying, oh, do you know Jake? Not, oh, do you know that guy? He has blue sweater on today, black hair, it, you know, these color eyes, all that kind of stuff. You don't start by that, you start with his name, right? Does that make sense? We give people and things and places names so we can refer to them easily and distinguish them from each other. Okay? So, that's what function notation is about primarily. It's about naming functions. Okay? Well, if we look at these functions, they don't have any names, they're all called y. Y is this, the function y is 5x, and what function y is 13x minus 3, the function y is x over 4. Okay. So function notation gives these functions names. Okay. So here's how we would change it, each of these using function notation. We might call this one f. Instead of calling it y, call it f. Okay. And at the same time, I'm gonna put parentheses x. It's a function of x, meaning that x is the independent variable. X is the thing that you're, that is our input, okay? So this is f of x. f is the name of the function, so I can say, hey, look at that, look at f over there, okay? f is different from g, okay? They have different names. This one we could call h. And this one we could call, uh, what? So here's f of x, f of x is equal to x plus 9. If you want to know what f of x is worth, what y is worth, you'll do x plus 9. g of x, on the other hand, if you want to find out what its output is, you'll take your input and multiply it by 5. h is 13x minus 3. k is given by x divided by 4. So f of x, g of x, h of x, k of x, whatever, they're, they don't mean anything different than y. Okay? They just mean this is the output. Okay? But we use it because it gives each function a name so that if now I wanted to talk about them, I can say, look at h of x. You look right over at h of x, and we can start talking about it. Okay? And especially when we have functions that interact with each other, it's a lot more helpful to be able to distinguish one from the other. So, what's the first thing about function notation? Right? Name. Names. You name the function. What's the name of this function? What's the name of it? Okay. Good. The name is actually just name is just h. So I can say the function h. I don't have to say h of x. h of x implies, now I'm going to put something in for x and figure out what comes out, what the output would be. Okay? So, names, the names are just the letter out front. So, that's the first thing. Just distinguishes one function from the other. And if I wanted to add f of x to g of x, I can write that. I can write f of x plus g of x, add them together. I think you could say f plus g if I wanted. You know what I'm saying. I want to take that f and add it to that g. Okay. <coughs> so 
all the words that I just got done saying in the last seven or so minutes is to tell you that function notation gives functions names. That's the, the first and uh, one of the most important things about function notation. Uh, okay, so the next thing is if I wanted you to take this function and evaluate, what does evaluate a function mean? Vocab we've used before. Evaluate this function. You remember what that means? Okay. Solve it. Solve it. I think you're on the right track. We're going to solve it. Find out what x is. Okay, evaluate actually means I'll tell you what x is. Plug it in and see what comes out. Right? So evaluate means put a number for x that I'll tell you and then figure out what y would be. Right? So one of the most easy, easiest things we could do with a function a number for x and then just see what happens. Okay. So if I want you to evaluate it for x equals two, I have to say that long sentence. I have to say, take that function right here. I have to point at it because it doesn't. You know, if I don't use function notation, it doesn't have a name, so I have to point at it. Take this, evaluate it for x equals two, which means plug it into for x and figure out what y would be. Why don't you do that? Then just take this function. I mean, it's going to take one second. Evaluate it for x equals two. What is this function worth when x is two? Throw it out. 11. 11. 9 plus 2 is 11. That's the output of the function when the input is 2. That's a lot of words. We're, we're saying take that function. It doesn't have a name, so I have to point at it. Take this function right here. And so I have to write it out, and then I have to say evaluate it for x equals 2. Okay. Let's make that a shorter process. This is just f. Well, when I say f, you know which function I'm talking about. Not this one, or this one, or this one. That one over there. This function f. And I want to know what f of 2 is. Well, it's the same or exact thing as what we just did. Put 2 in for x. This x being here tells you where to put the input. right? What letter is standing for the input. You can see over here there's an x. I can change that. We could make it a different letter. We could use the letter M. Okay. Now this is a function that's called G, and M is the letter that stands for the input, where you put everything in. Okay. So f of 2 just means put 2 in for x. So just test and see if you're if that's getting through without just blurting that out. Uh, figure out what f of 2 is. So I'll just write down what f of 2 is and uh, I'll come around and see if what I'm saying is being said in a way that you understand. So it didn't quite get through. That's not your fault. Uh, f of 2 just means that x is 2. Okay. f of x, right? x is the input. x is the thing is the place where, over here on the right side of the equation, that's where you're going to put your input. Okay. What's the input now? Oh, it's, it's not just x. It's not just a variable. It's specifically 2. Okay. So if the input is 2, 
into the function that we're calling f. How do we do that? How do we let x be 2 in this function? Or what are we going to get as a result? Just let x be 2. Let x be 2, what do you get? x be 2, what do I do with x? I add 9 to it. What do I get? 11. So what's f of 2? It's 11. Okay. Let's find So first, how do we say this? How do we read it? How is it pronounced? This thing right here. How do we say that? I said it a bunch of times in this example, yeah? H of 3. Very good. H of 3. First, let's just say what H of 3 is. What is H of 3? Very end of the day, what is h of 3? It's 36. h of 3 is 36. When we say h of 3, we're really saying it's a shortened form of, of this right here. Uh, the value of h. When we say the value of h, the value of function, we mean what is the output? You get what is the value means what do you get what is the output what is the y value the value of h when x equals 3 so we, we shorten that down into this this much shorter statement h of 3 the value of h uh, when x is 3 H of three, what do you do? Okay. You plug in three for X, all right? Plug in three for X. And in, in H's case, in the case of the function H, when you put in three for X, you take 13 times that X, 13 times three minus three. So you get 13 times three is 39, minus three gives us 36. Um, be a, kind of a tricky question. What is k of uh, t? t?
We need a running start here up to k of t. What does f of 2 mean? What do you do? Okay. Plug 2 in for x, specifically into the function we call that, right? So what does h of 3 mean? What? Plug 3 in for x, okay, so a little bit of a leap. What does k of t mean? Right? Plug t in for x, right? Replace, replace x with 2, replace x with 3, replace x with t, right? Some other thing, t over 4. Here t is, well now x is t. <coughs> All right, I'm going to go even a little loftier, and I'm going to ask you to tell me what is f of uh, <coughs> with t plus 6. F of t plus 6. Same logic applies to this one as we did for the last three. Putting t plus 6 in those parentheses means the exact same thing it did for the last three again. Uh, all right, so f of t means to put 2 in for x. Uh, h of 3 means put 3 in for x in h. Uh, k of t means put t in for x in k, or the function we call k. So f of t plus 6 means put t plus 6 in for x in the function f. Go to the function f and put in t plus 6 in place of x. Okay, so here's x, right? I like to, when I do substitutions like this, I like to just take out the x, the thing that I'm supposed to replace, just put a parenthesis there, leave a blank, and that's the rest of f of x. f of x looks like uh, something plus 9. So the thing that I'm going to add 9 to is t plus 6. Replace x with t plus 6. x goes away, t plus 6 comes in. Well, I have drawn parentheses here, that was a good idea. Nothing's happening to the parentheses, right? It's not being multiplied by anything, it's not being raised to an exponent. Nothing's happening. So we don't really need those parentheses as part of the operation. t plus 6 plus 9, 6 plus 9 is 15. Then we get t plus 15. Be careful, I saw more than a, a couple 15t, right? 15t and t plus 15, not the same. Adding 15 to t, 15's kind of a big number, you add 15 to it, that's, that's kind of a big change. But multiplying t times 15, that's way different than just adding a 15. So, not the same thing, be careful there. <coughs> All right. Then we're, maybe you feel like we're spending too much time on this, so you can trust that we are not, okay? Because it uh, definitely is challenging Every, every time I teach function notation. Um, let's see. About number 13. And four, four, seven, number 13.
So what does it say? What, how do we say it? How do we pronounce it? F of negative 2. What does it mean that we're supposed to do, Jada? Plug negative 2 in for x. There's x. I'm going to put negative 2 right there. Specific, and we'll say the, the input is exactly negative two. Okay, negative two is what I want you to put in for the input. So that's going to replace all the x's that you see on the other side with negative two. So I'm going to leave that part. That hoping that I explained it so well that you won't make those common mistakes. We'll see. Uh, I'll go that. So that just means plug that thing in. All right. Um, so, okay. Let's let's start with a simple example. say that f of x is equal to 3. If I tell you that f of x is equal to 3, what can you, what can you figure out from that information? x is 3. So you're saying that because this is 3 that x is 3? If I want x to be 3, where do I put the 3? this is saying. This is saying, I got three. Not I put in three, but I've gotten out three. Right. Think about it. This, as I said before, it's the same thing as y. I've just written a little differently with a name and a, and a, a name for the, the function and uh, specifying what the input variable is. Okay. This is just the output. f of x means the output. Just like y means the output. x means input, y means output. X means input, well, f of x means output. Okay. This is just what you get out. So what I get out is 3. Right? So we could write this. 6x plus 9 happened, and then what, what did we get as a result? We got 3. Right? So when I say f of x, that whole thing is 3, I'm saying the output is 3. What we get out is 3. Okay. You just look at it as a, as a simple substitution. Here's f of x, here's f of x. f of x is 3, so I can replace f of x three because it's the same thing. If f of x is equal to three, then I should be able to put three in place of f of x. And we can simply solve for x. Subtract nine, six x equals negative six, x equals negative one. Almost in 
parameter change function and output. The value of the function is three, the value of the output is three. So if we make the output three, then we can figure out what the input was. We go the other way. We can plug in something for the input and figure out what the output is. Or we could say, the output is this, what would the input have to be? So, mm, let's do 17. 17 has all sorts of weird letters and stuff. I'll write that just for you in case. J of X equals 17. Function is worth negative 13. The function is worth negative 13. <coughs> Remember what I just said? When I say the function is worth something, when I say the function is worth something, I'm saying the output is worth this thing. So the function is worth negative 13, or the output is worth negative 13. So, so if I say the function or the uh, output is worth negative 13, what am I wanting you to find? The output is negative 13, so what do you use to figure out? The input. The x value. Okay? Go for it. You're not just plugging in numbers for x and guessing. You're actually using algebra and solving. Stating this so that you hopefully you get, get this, this message loud and clear. When the function is worth something, the function is the output. That's what the purpose of a function is, is to turn input into output. If the input just goes in and nothing comes out, that's not a function. Okay? The, the usefulness of a function, the value of a function, is its output. Okay? So the function has the given value, this is the given value, that means the output has that value. Okay. So something went in for x and we got negative 13 as the output, as the value of the function. And solve by subtracting 11 on both sides.
graph this function. <coughs> so you graph this function right here. Don't forget, don't, don't worry about the negative 13. That's not a part of the function. That's just an example of one of the outputs you can get. So graph this function, j of x equals 4x plus 11. J of x, it's the exact same thing as y, so you can just write this as y equals 4x plus 11, do the same exact process. Need a reminder, you can go back to 4.5. 4.5 is probably all you need to know. I mean, they didn't even draw the axes. Um, so drawing axes would be good to start with. Real quick, we have mx plus b here. mx plus b. So our b is 11, y-intercept of 11, slope is 4, <coughs> up 4 and over 1. Let's come this direction. 4 and over 1, over 1, okay. Negative six, negative six, comma, negative thirteen. Okay. Um, I'm gonna write the homework on the board right now. If you wanna hang out, write that down. If not, it'll be on the website. Well, have a good day.